Representative Garofalo, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's start by talking about Farmington. What kind of community is it? Uh, Farmington is on the southern outskirts of the Twin Cities suburban area. It's uh, central Dakota County. So think of it as uh, east of Highway 35, west of Highway 52. Highway 50 runs right through it. It's a growing community, uh, used, uh, home of the Dakota County Fair, Farmington High School, and uh, adjacent to some townships and communities. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a fast growing community, well over 20,000 residents. And tell us about your district, 58B, kind of uh, more broad, broaden it out a little bit. What are the other areas that you uh, uh, represent and what kind of issues are important to your constituents? Uh, in addition to the city of Farmington, House District 58B contains portions of rural Dakota and Goodhue counties. So it stretches all the way to the Wisconsin border in the east and then stretches down into the southern portions of uh, southern side of Dakota County and into northern Goodhue County. Cities of Denison, Stanton Township, Warsaw Township are in the district. The district is really comprised of three areas. One is the northern Farmington area. Second is downtown Farmington where there's more senior citizens, more of us um, long-term residents. And then third and finally are the small towns and the townships that are that comprise the rest of the legislative district. In the rural portions of the district, there's a lot of concern right now about the trade war and commodity prices. Farmers are really, they're really being hurt by these low prices and not being able to bring their their crops to market at a at a reasonable price. And it's it's taking a toll on on these families who have large farms, large capital expenditures, but the, the commodities prices are hurting. Uh, in the uh, downtown Farmington area, a lot of concern about health care, particularly quality of care and cost. Um, you know, you have a, more of the population is on um, Medicare, senior citizens and Social Security. So whenever people are talking about reforming Medicare, there's concerns about, about that. In the North Farmington side, there's more of a focus on transportation, more of a focus on education, and making sure that we keep taxes low. For the most part, people in our area, they, they go to work, uh, they play by the rules. They want to see government do good things to keep the roads paved, lock up the bad guys, and educate the kids. But for the most part, all three portions of the legislative district, they want to keep the government off their back and out of their wallet. And that's what the, those are the top issues we're hearing about. And how did you feel about the November budget and economic forecast? $1.3 billion surplus. I, I saw that you released a statement that said you're committed to returning as much of that money back to taxpayers as possible through tax relief. Um, how would you like to see the surplus used? So yeah, the Minnesota has a large budget surplus. We have billions of dollars that are actually sitting in the bank as well. And so that's a, that's a sign of a pro prosperous economy. It's happening for many reasons, one of which is that Minnesota has a, a very diverse economy. And so when, the, when that economy is growing, it all, a rising tide lifts all boats. In terms of what I'd like to see it happen, Minnesota has become a, a very expensive state to live in. And there are some things that we know are going to be more expensive. For example, we have to heat our homes in the summer. Warm weather climates, they don't have to do that. We, we come to expect that. But there's other costs where we're choosing to have, because of public policy, we're seeing expensive costs. For example, in the area of our charitable gaming, where we have VFWs and pull tabs, those operations, the government actually makes more money off of taxes than those non-private uh, those, those uh, nonprofits, what they actually make in charitable contributions to their organizations. That's wrong. We should lower those taxes. Uh, in addition, the license tabs in Minnesota are exceptionally expensive to the point that they're actually encouraging people to, ha to have their vehicles be plated in other states. We want to we wanna stop that. We can still fund transportation without having the license tabs uh, as high as we do. And then third and finally, there's been a growth in the number of sales taxes, uh, local sales taxes. We need to stop that and get those taxes reduced. And again, we have the resources here at the state to cover for the any of the lost revenue that would, would account for that. But it's about making sure that people are able to keep more of the money they're working for, the items they're purchasing, they're gonna be lower cost, and that we're able to continue to Minnesota to have a high quality of life and a high standard of life. How do you feel about Governor Tim Walz's $2 billion capital investment proposal? Well, it's big, there's a lot in there. I mean. It's so big that I thought maybe he was funding some projects in Iowa when I saw it. But I, I think that it's important to recognize there's a difference between borrowing money for operating costs, which the federal government does, which is very irresponsible, and borrowing money for capital costs. And this is meant for asset preservation. So 
boring things like replace, replacing leaky roofs or heating and cooling systems, repairing sidewalks. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure that's reaching the end of its life expectancy, so I'm in favor of those portions that do those things, that preserve the things we already have. When it comes to building shiny and new things, I'm more skeptical of that. And so I would say that I think that we'd, we'd be better off uh, having the governor shift more of his priorities towards that, that focus of asset preservation as opposed to, to new things. And it, it really, things like wastewater infrastructure, we have small towns across Minnesota that are federally mandated or mandated by the state to, to achieve wa uh, clean water objectives that they simply don't have the money to pay for. And they, they need that help and the state should contribute to it. And you serve on the House Energy and Climate and Commerce Committees here in the House. Um, is there any areas or uh, is there any priorities you think that the committee should focus on in 2020? Well, again, I think it's important that we're focusing on affordability. Minnesota's become too expensive of a state. And so whether it's making sure that we're, as we're reducing pollution and our electricity sources, that we're also lowering costs, that we're doing things in a smart way, that in the area of transportation or government regulation, that we, we get, rid of, get rid of those redundancies, eliminate those inefficiencies, and we're able to lower taxes and lower fees as, as much as possible. There's a lot of, in Minnesota, it's not an easy place to start a business or keep a business open. And we need to change our policies so that makes it, continues to make Minnesota a, a vibrant place to do business. You've seen lately a lot of restaurants, good restaurants in Minneapolis and St. Paul closing. And we need to have policies that keep these, these small businesses open, not just having a bunch of corporate owned chains. And as we sit here today, we're a couple days away from the Super Bowl. Uh, there gonna be a lot of sports betting out in Vegas and even down in Iowa, but not here in Minnesota. Um, you're kind of the face, or be, become the face a little bit, of legalized sports betting here in Minnesota. You, you've proposed legislation in the past. Why is it an important issue for you, and why hasn't it gotten support here that it needs to become law? Yeah, I've somehow turned into like... <laughs> kind I, of, I, yeah. I feel like pretty soon I'm going to be doing commercials for Diamond Joe's down in <laughs> Iowa. I've been talking about it so much. But I, I think it's important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one is that this is a funding source for the underground black market economy. This is a funding source for organized crime that I think people candidly are a bit naive about how this is funding criminal enterprises. Second of all, our consumers right now who are engaging in sports gambling, they have no consumer protections. It's easy for them to get ripped off. And third and finally, we have government spending in an area that really should be prioritized towards other forms of enforcement and, and laws that need to be, that should be enforced. So on top of that, you do have the expectation that this is a hospitality industry, people are engaging in it, and whenever possible, we should try to keep those hospitality dollars in the state of Minnesota. And it just makes sense that with something as popular as sports gambling, the overwhelm, it's, it's of the forms of gambling, it's one of the least likely to be susceptible to compulsive gambling. Other forms of gambling that we do have are much more likely to cause uh, addictive problems. So for those factors and other, that's why I want to see it happen here. In terms of why it's not happening in Minnesota, that's a matter of opinion, not a matter of fact. Uh, gambling issues by their very nature are provocative and controversial. And it's something that as we're seeing more states adopting, the culture in Minnesota has been to be some, uh, a state that does things later rather than sooner. I think that's foolish. I think we're losing out on opportunities. There's a lot of back-end businesses now that are growing in sports gambling in terms of data collection, data retention, and analytics, where Minnesota could be sort of a regional hub for, for information exchange, leveraging our knowledge and our workforce in the areas of technology. And I think we're missing that opportunity by not having legalized sports gambling. So I, I realize that at some point we're going to legalize sports gambling in Minnesota. It's probably going to happen later than I want it to. And in the meantime, we're going to have a lot of people driving to Iowa, using their phones to log on to Caribbean sports books, or just working with a, their local bookie as they do now. And that's a lost opportunity that benefits no one in the state of Minnesota except for those criminal enterprises. And this is the final question I had to ask you before we let you go. Going through uh, your Twitter bio, is it true you actually shook hands with old blue eyes? <laughs> is that true? You met Frank Sinatra? Or no, was this a handshake? Not, or? No, it's not it's true. It's not I, true. I actually missed an opportunity. When I was in high school, I worked at Met Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Met Center, we would set up chairs on the main floor. And people who remember the old Met Center remember they had seats that were yellow and green and black <laughs> and white. 
Well, when Frank Sinatra was there, they only wanted white seats on the main floor. So we would have to take a rack of chairs, pull them all out, only the white ones, lay them out, clean them up and set them up. <laughs> it happened to be that when Frank Sinatra was in town, he was watching us from a restaurant called the Observatory Club. And he saw that we were working very hard, doing a diligent task. And when we got done working that day, our manager came up to us with a, there's a gentleman standing there who said, uh, Mr. Sinatra appreciates uh, the work you're doing and he'd like, you to, he'd like to personally invite your team to be his guests at the show tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, I was dumb. I was like 16, 17 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was like, Frank Sinatra, I gotta go home and do something. <laughs> well, so a friend of mine stuck around, actually got to meet Sinatra. Wow. As he approached him, a big bodyguard stopped him. Okay. Uh, Sinatra, the guard looked at Sinatra, Sinatra nod, nodded his head. And my friend said to him, uh, Mr. Sinatra, that was a great show. You know, thank you very much. And Sinatra reached out, shook his hand and said, thanks, son. Wow. And got in the limo and left. And so, um, yeah, I should probably correct that untruth <laughs> in my uh, Twitter profile. But it, it, uh, a good friend of mine literally shook Sinatra's hand. And I, I would have been there with him if I just wouldn't have been so young and dumb. So there's could've a, uh, it could have been me. It could have been. So I guess, I guess I shook his hand in my dreams. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe I'll update the Twitter profile with that.